The Chronicles of Priday by Lloyd Alexander. Book 5 The High King. Chapter 1 Homecomings. Under a chill gray sky, two riders jogged across the turf. Taran, the taller horseman, set his face against the wind and leaned forward in the saddle, his eyes on the distant hills. At his belt hung a sword, and from his shoulder a silver bound battle horn. His companion, Gurgi, shaggier than the pony he rode, pulled his weathered cloak around him, rubbed his frost-nipped ears, and began groaning so wretchedly that Tarn at last reined up the stallion. No, no, Gurgi cried. A faithful Gurgi will keep on. He follows kindly master. Oh, yes, as he has always done. Never mind his shakings and achings. Never mind the droopings of his poor tender head. Tarn smiled, seeing that Gurgi, despite his bold words, was eyeing a sheltering grove of ash trees. <laughs> there is time to spare, he answered. I long to be home, but not at the cost of that poor tender head of yours. We camp here and go no farther until morning. They tethered their mounts and built a small fire in a ring of stones. Gurgi curled up and was snoring almost before he had finished swallowing his food. Though as weary as his companion, Tarn set about mending the harness leathers. Suddenly he stopped and jumped to his feet. Overhead, a winged shape plunged swiftly toward him. Look! Tarn cried as Gurgi, still heavy with sleep, sat up and blinked. It's Ka! Dolwyn must have sent him to find us! The crow beat his wings, clacked his beak, and began squawking loudly even before he landed on Tarn's outstretched wrist. I long way! Ka croaked at the top of his voice. I long way! Princess! Home! Tarn's weariness fell from him like a cloak. Gurgi, wide awake and shouting joyfully, scurried to unloose the steeds. Tarn leaped astride Malenlis, spun the gray stallion about, and galloped from the grove, with Ka perched on his shoulder and Gurgi and the pony pounding at his heels. Day and night they rode, hardly halting for a mouthful of food or a moment of sleep, urging all speed and strength from their mounts and from themselves, ever southward, down from the mountain valley and across Great Arvin until... On a bright morning, the fields of Caer Dalbin lay before them once again. From the instant Tarn set foot across the threshold, such a commotion filled the cottage that he scarcely knew which way to turn. Ka had immediately begun jabbering and flapping his wings. Call, whose great bald crown and broad face shone with delight, was clapping Tarn on the back, while Gurgi shouted in glee and leaped up and down in a cloud of shedding hair. Even the ancient enchanter Dolben, who seldom let anything disturb his meditations, hobbled out of his chamber to observe the welcomings. In the midst of it all, Tarn could hardly glimpse Ilanwe, though he heard the voice of the princess very clearly above the din. Tarn of care, Dolben! she cried as he strove to draw near her. I've been waiting to see you for days! After all the time I've been away learning to be a young lady, as if I weren't one before I left. When I'm home at last, you're not even here! In another moment, he was at her side. The slender princess still wore at her throat the crescent moon of silver, and on her finger the ring crafted by the fair folk. But now a band of gold circled her brow, and the richness of her apparel made Tarn suddenly aware of his travel-stained cloak and muddy boots. And if you think living in a castle is pleasant, Ilanwe went on without a pause for breath, I can tell you it isn't. It's weary and dreary. They've made me sleep in beds with goose feather pillows, enough to stifle you. I'm sure the geese needed them more than I did. Uh, the feathers, that is, not the pillows. And servitors to bring you exactly what you don't want to eat. And washing your hair, whether it needs it or not. And sewing and weaving and curtsying and all such I don't even want to think about. I've not drawn a sword for I don't know how long. Ilanwe stopped abruptly and looked curiously at Taran. That's odd, she said. There's something different about you. It's not your hair, though it does look as if you cropped it yourself with your eyes shut. It's, well, I can't quite say. I mean, unless you told someone, they'd never guess you were an assistant pig keeper. Tarn laughed fondly at Ilanwe's puzzled frown. <laughs> Alas, it's been long since I last tended Henwin. Indeed, when we journeyed among the folk of the free comets, Gurgi and I toiled at nearly everything but pig keeping. This cloak I wove at the loom of Dwyvak, the weaver woman. 
This sword, heavy at the smith, taught me the forging of it. And this, he said with a trace of sadness, drawing an earthen bowl from his jacket, such as it is, I made it the wheel of Anla Clay Shaper. He put the bowl in her hands. If it pleases you, it is yours. It's lovely, answered Ilanway. Yes, I shall treasure it. But that's not what I mean, too. I'm not saying you aren't a good assistant pig keeper, because I'm sure you're the best in Pridane. But there's something more. You speak the truth, princess, put in Call. He's left us a pig keeper and comes back looking as if he could do all he set his hand to. Whatever. Tyron shook his head. I learned I was neither swordsmith nor weaver, nor, alas, a shaper of clay. Gurgi and I were already homeward bound when Ka found us, and here we shall stay. I'm glad of that, replied Ilanwe. All anyone knew about you was that you were wandering every which way. Dalvin told me you were seeking your parents. Then you met someone you thought was your father, but wasn't. Or was it the other way around? I didn't altogether understand it. There is little to understand, Taran said. What I sought, I found, though it was not what I had hoped. No, it was not, murmured Dalvin, who had been watching Taran closely. You found more than you shot and gained, perhaps, <laughs> more than you know. I still don't see why you wanted to leave Care Dolvin, Ilanwe began. Tarin had no chance to reply, for now his hand was seized and shaken vigorously. Hello, hello, cried a young man with pale blue eyes and straw-colored hair. His handsomely embroidered cloak looked as though it had been water-soaked, then wrung out to dry. His boot lacings, broken in several places, had been retied in large, straggling knots. Prince Rune! Tarn had almost failed to recognize him. Rune had grown taller and leaner, though his grin was as broad as it had ever been. King Rune, actually, the young man answered. Since my father died last summer, that's one of the reasons why Princess Ilanwe is here now. My mother wanted to keep her with us on Mona to finish her education. Then you know my mother. She'd never left off with it, even though Dalvin had sent word Arlanwe was to come home. And so, he added proudly, they finally put my foot down. I ordered a ship fitted out, and off we sailed for Mona Haven. Amazing what a king can do when he sets his mind to it. We've brought someone else along, too, Rune continued, gesturing toward the fireside, where Taran, for the first time, noticed a pudgy little man sitting with a cook pot between his knees. The stranger licked his fingers and wrinkled a flabby nose at Tarn. He made no attempt to rise, but only nodded curtly while the scraggly fringe of hair around his bulbous head stirred like weeds underwater. Tarn stared, not believing what he saw. The little man drew himself up and sniffed with a mixture of haughtiness and wounded feelings. One should have no trouble remembering a giant, he said testily. Remember you, replied Tarn. How could I not? The cavern on Mona? Last time I saw you, though, you were bigger, to say the least. But it is you, nevertheless. It is indeed. Glue! When I was a giant, Glue said, you would have forgotten me so quickly. Unfortunate that things weren't down as they did. Now in the cavern... You've started him off again, Ilanwe whispered to Tarin. He'll go on like that until you're fairly wilted about the glorious days he used to, when he used to be a giant. You'll only stop talking to eat and only stop eating to talk. I could understand his eating since he lived on nothing but mushrooms for so long, but he must have been a wretched as a giant and you'd think he'd want to forget it. I knew Dolvin sent Ka with a potion to shrink Glue back to size, Tarin answered. Of what happened to him since then, I had, not, I had no word. That's what happened to him, said Ilanwe. As soon as he got free of the cavern, he made his way to Rune's castle. No one had the heart to turn him away, though we bored us all the tears with those endless pointless tales of his. We took him with us when we sailed, thinking he'd be grateful to Dalbin and want to thank him properly. Not a bit of it. We almost had to twist his ears to get him aboard. Now that he's here, I wish we'd left him where he was. But three of our companions are missing, Tarn said, glancing around the cottage. Good old Dolly and Fluid or Flam. And I had hoped Prince Guardian might have come to welcome my lawn way. Dolly sends his best wishes, said Call. But we shall have to do without his company. Our dwarf friend is harder to root out of the fair folk realm than a stump out of a field. <laughs> He'll not budge. 
As for fluid or phlegm, nothing can keep him and his harp from any merrymaking, whatever. He should have been here long since. <laughs> Prince Guidian as well, <laughs> Dalbin added. <laughs> he and I have matters to discuss. <laughs> Though you young people may doubt it, some of them are even weightier than the homecomings of a princess <laughs> and an assistant pig keeper. <laughs> Well, I shall put this on again when Fluider and Prince Gwydion arrive, said I longly, taking the golden circlet from her brow, just so they can see how it looks. But I won't wear it a moment longer. It's rubbed a blister and it makes my head ache, like someone squeezing your neck only higher up. <laughs> ah, princess, Dalbin said with a furrowed smile. A crown is more discomfort than adornment. If you have learned that, you have already learned much. Learning, I longly declared. I've been up to my ears in learning. It doesn't show, so it's hard to believe it's there. Wait, that's not quite true either. Here, I've learned this. From her cloak, she drew a large square of folded cloth and almost shyly handed it to Taran. I embroidered it for you. It's not finished yet, but I wanted you to have it even so. Though I admit it's not as handsome as the things you've made. Taran spread out the fabric. As broad as his outstretched arms, the somewhat straggle-threaded embroidery showed a white, blue-eyed pig against a field of green. It's meant to be Henwen, Ilanwe explained as Rune and Gurgi pressed forward to study the handiwork more closely. At first, I tried to embroider you onto it, too, Ilanwe said to Taran, because you're so fond of Hen and because, and because I was thinking of you. But you came out looking like sticks with a bird's nest on top, not yourself at all. So I had to start over with Hen alone. You'll just have to make believe you're standing beside her a little to the left. Otherwise, I'd never have got this much done, and I did work the summer on it. If I was in your thoughts then, Taran said, your work gladdens me all the more. No matter that Hen's eyes are really brown. Ilanwe looked at him in sudden dismay. You don't like it! <laughs> I do, in all truth, Taran assured her. Brown or blue makes no difference. It will be useful. Useful, cried Ilanwe. Useful is not the point. It's a keepsake, not a horse blanket. Taran of Care Dolbin, you don't understand anything at all. At least, Taran replied with a good natured grin, I know the color of Henwin's eyes. Ilanwe tossed her red gold hair and put her chin in the air. Humph, she said, and very likely forgotten the color of mine. Not so, princess, Taran answered quietly. Nor have I forgotten when you gave me this, he added, taking up the battle horn. Its powers were greater than either of us knew. They are gone now, but I treasure it still because it came from your hands. You asked why I sought to know my parentage, Tarn went on, because I hoped it would prove noble and give me the right to ask what I dared not ask before. My hope was mistaken, yet even without it, Tarn hesitated, searching for the most fitting words. Before he could speak again, the cottage door burst open and Taran cried out in alarm. At the threshold stood Fluid or Flam. The bard's face was ashen, his ragged yellow hair clung to his forehead. On his shoulder he bore the limp body of a man. Taran, with Rune behind him, sprang to help. Gurgi and Ilanwe followed as they lowered the still figure to the ground. Glue, his pudgy cheeks quivering, stared speechless. At the first instant, Taran had nearly staggered at the shock. Now his hands worked quickly, almost of themselves, to unclasp the cloak and loosen the torn jacket. Before him, on the hard-packed earth, lay Gwydian, Prince of Dawn. Blood crusted the warrior's wolf-gray hair and stained his weathered face. His lips were drawn back, his teeth set in battle rage. Gwydian's cloak muffled one arm, as though at last he had sought to defend himself with that alone. Lord Gwydian is slain! Ilanwe cried. He lives, though barely. Taran said. Fetch medicines, he ordered Gurgi. The healing herbs from my saddlebags. He stopped short and turned to Dalbin. Forgive me. It is not for me to command under my master's roof, but the herbs are of great power. Adeon, son of Talison, gave them to me long ago. They are yours if you wish them. Eh, eh, I know their nature and have none that will serve better, Dalbin answered. Eh, nor should you fear to command under any roof, eh, since you have learned to command yourself. I trust your skill as I see you trust it. Do as you see fit. Call was already hurrying from the scullery with water in a basin. 
Dalbin, who had knelt at Gwydion's side, rose and turned to the bard. Eh, what evil deed is this? The old enchanter spoke hardly above a whisper, yet his voice rang through the cottage and his eyes blazed in anger. Eh, whose hand dared strike him? Eh? The huntsman of Anuvin, replied Fluider. Two lives they almost claimed. How did you fare? He urgently asked Tarin. How did you outride them so quickly? Be thankful it went no worse for you. Tarin, puzzled, glanced up at the distraught bard. Your words have no meaning, Fluider. Meaning? Answered the bard. They mean what they say. Gwydion would have traded his life for yours when the huntsman set upon you not an hour ago. Set upon me? Tarin's perplexity grew. How can that be? Gurgi and I saw no huntsman, and we've been at Caer Dalbin this hour past. Great villain! A flam sees what he sees! cried Fluider. A fever is working on you, Tarin said. You too may be wounded more grievously than you know. Rest easy, we shall give you all the help we can. He turned again to Gwydi and opened the packet of herbs which Gurgi had brought and set them to steep in the basin. Dalbin's face was clouded. Eh, let the bard speak! he said. Eh, there is much in his words that troubles me. Eh. Lord Gwydion and I rode together from the northern lands, Fluider began. We'd crossed Arvin and were well on our way here, a little distance ahead of us, in a clearing. The bard paused and looked directly at Tarin. I saw you with my own eyes. You were hard-pressed. You shouted to us for help and waved us onward. Gwydion outdistanced me. Fluider went on. You'd already galloped beyond the clearing. Gwydion rode after you like the wind. Lion carried me swiftly, but by the time I caught up, there was no sign of you at all. Yet huntsmen aplenty. They had dragged Gwydion from his saddle. They would have paid with their own lives had they stood against me, cried Fluider. But they fled when I rode up. Gwydion was close to death, and I dared not leave him. Fluider bowed his head. His hurt was beyond my skill to treat. I could do no more than bring him here as you see him. You saved his life, my friend, Tarrant said. And lost what Gwydion would have given his life to keep, cried the bard. The huntsman failed to slay him, but a greater evil has befallen him. They've stripped him of his sword, blade and scabbard. Tarrant caught his breath. Concerned only for his companion's wounds, he had not seen that Drinwin, the black sword, hung no longer at Gwydion's side. Terror filled him. Drinwin, the enchanted blade, the flaming weapon of ancient power, was in the huntsman's hands. They would bear it to their master, to Arryn Deathlord, in the dark realm of Anuvin. Fluider sank to the ground and put his head in his hands. And my own wits are lost, since you tell me it was not yourself who called out to us. What you saw, I cannot judge, Tarin said. Gwydion's life is our first care. We will talk of these things when your memory is clear. The harper's memory is clear enough. A black-robed woman moved from the dark corner where she had been silently listening and stepped slowly into the midst of the company. Her long, unbound hair glittered like pale silver. The deadly beauty of her face had not altogether vanished. Though well, now it seemed shadowy, worn away, lingering as a dream only half recalled. Ill fortune mars our meeting, assistant pig keeper, Arkin said, but welcome nonetheless. What then? Do you still fear me? She added, seeing Tarn's uneasy glance. She smiled, her teeth were sharp. Neither has Elanwe, daughter of Ongrad, forgotten my powers. Though it was she who destroyed them at the castle of Lear. Yet, since I have dwelt here, have I not served Dalbin as well as any of you? Arkin strode to the outstretched form of Gwydion. Tauron saw a look almost of pity on her cold eyes. Lord Gwydion will live, she said. But he may find a life a crueler fate than death. She bent and with her fingertips lightly touched the warrior's brow, then drew her hand away and faced the bard. Your eyes did not play you false, Harper, Arkin said. You saw what was meant for you to see. A pig keeper? Why not, if thus he should choose to appear? Only one wields such a power. Arryn himself, Lord of Anuvin, 
Land of the Dead.